10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the CFE Media and Technology Education Session, Best Practices for Designing Smart Buildings. I'm your moderator, Amara Rasgis, with CFE Media and Technology. Let's tackle some important things before we dive into this topic. In keeping with our CEP policy, please take some time to read the quality assurance slide. This session is designed for technicians and engineers who want to understand the fundamentals and some best practices when designing smart buildings. If you're interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate, use the resources option on the left side of your screen. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects continuing education system policy, please take some time to read the quality assurance slide. Thank you. For a seamless online experience, here are some tips. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below the session's agenda. If you would like to take notes within the session, click on the left panel labeled Notes to do so. This session is available on demand if you need to come back at any time. Here's a list of the learning objectives. We'll touch on these in today's presentation. Additional resources can be viewed and downloaded on the left side of the screen below the session's agenda. There are also underlined hyperlinks to references and resources throughout the presentation. Let me introduce today's speakers. Julianne Lau is Director of Building Performance at Mortensen. She specializes in sustainable design for energy conservation and indoor air quality and is responsible for establishing and executing sustainable initiatives. She's well-versed on this topic and works on several types of facilities for various clients. Julianne is a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board, and she was a 2012 Consulting Specifying Engineer 40 Under 40 Award winner. Sanjyot Bussari leads Affiliated Engineers National Intelligent Building Practice. He has close to 20 years of experience in intelligent buildings, energy management, system integration, and commissioning. SANS clients include corporate real estate campuses, colleges and universities, and healthcare institutions. He has designed solutions that address occupant experience, op operational optimization, and energy reduction as outcomes of intelligent building strategies. His work covers a wide range of facility management functions. It's my pleasure to work with two of the most knowledgeable smart building experts in the industry. Julianne, let's get started. Thanks, Amara. Uh, for today's presentation purposes, um, in, in order to even organize our thoughts, San and I have broken this ginormous topic and presentation into four primary parts. Um, we'll start out with more of a definition of smart buildings or defining what they are and what they can do. Next, we'll dive into the primary or predominant building blocks of smart buildings. Uh, we'll move into discussing and selecting platforms and then finally walk through a few case studies on projects that we've been involved with. Next slide, please. So like a lot of new ideas or technologies, um, smart buildings don't have one singular definition or one succinct statement used in its definition. So additionally, there's really not a minimum set of parameters or requirements to be considered smart or intelligent. And there's no formalized rating system that illustrates how smart a building might be. So this is why we have a longer section on definition. And I wanted to preface this before we even started to get into the slides. Um, so before that even still, I want to take a stab at an unstructured or loose definition that I think most practitioners could possibly agree upon. And so here it is. Smart buildings use automated processes to manage and control operations. So think HVAC, using a fully integrated network of sensors, actuators, microchips um, that generate a constant stream of raw data. 
that data is then, or at least can be converted into some key insights. So it's kind of a loose definition, um, and, and that, that leads me into uh, the next slide, please. So these are what we're looking at as the basics. And they're not prioritized in any order, but, and you will see that they are all pretty much interrelated. So the interconnection of technology, meaning how different devices and technologies interact with each other. There needs to be some level of interconnection. Uh, we have to extend that connection to people, computers, and data. So I'm not a digital native. It's not always easy for me to interact that way. My kids are completely different and um, you can't get me started on my parents. That's a whole other mess of uh, the human interface. But because human range in their digital abilities as well as have a range of data analytics understanding and capabilities, smart buildings have to be able to connect humans to the interface being used and the data being presented. It's gotta be seamless. So next is the ability to measure and report. Um, another fun fact about me, I come from a family of carpenters and do-it-yourselfers, and the saying is always measure twice, cut once. And in smart buildings and in, in the analytics that I work on, um, is that you can't manage what you don't measure. And those measurements need to be reported in a way that can really be understood. So intelligence. And intelligence seems like a synonym for smart, and you'll hear San and I inter interchange smart and intelligent you know, frequently during this presentation. And what I mean here is that it needs to have intelligence. It, it means that the system should intelligently and inherently be able to vary its actions and respond to other actions or situations or experiences, you know, automatically. IoT of things, um, <laughs> right? We need to have a system that uses the common internet protocol and IoT platforms to connect multiple devices, such as the sensors and microchips being used, and to exchange and analyze all of that information. Automation, and for smart buildings, they need to be efficient and effective, save time, save money, save effort, meaning that they have to automate themselves. They have to meet the needs and goals, and that process should really be truly automated. Next slide, please. So next. What would drive the decision to go smart? What are the success factors? What are the benefits? And the answer is it depends. The drivers listed on this slide are inherent to what a customer wants or needs. It's trying to figure out what's wrong and using smart building technologies to address those issues. These are, it's pr problem solving. Only through good and in-depth discussions with clients will you know which ones apply to your projects. And Sam and I'll talk more about what drives individual stakeholders to request smart building technologies in a few minutes, as well as who those stakeholders are. And I'll just give you a heads up and looking in, and letting you read all of these different drivers, um, but what some of the more common ones are. So not surprisingly, I think the most common deals around energy efficiency and energy cost savings. And those cost savings could be either from maintenance or, or energy efficiency. Um, those of us in the HVAC and building automation world you have been looking at this since the 80s, but only recently looking at how they integrate with other systems. So how that integrates with lighting, card access, room scheduling, things like that. Um, another one is to improve occupant, uh, tenant occupant experience, whether it's comfort, security, or productivity. And um, one of those that I'll at least point out is in the commercial and multifamily residential sector. And that's the ability to be able to showcase these technologies to increase the amount of lease space in a building or charge higher lease rates. So next slide. So how do we take, uh, or we've talked all this smart, what a smart building is um, and what some of the goals are, but it's important to note that not all customers have the same goals or same lens when it comes to making a facility smart. And in the end, it's important to understand their business as well as the market they're in. So of all of these groupings listed on this slide, not all of them will have the same set of smart building priorities or platforms. So healthcare needs are very different from sports. And while we think that office and education spaces have similar needs, those are going to vary for them as well because of different timings, different locations, um, and different priorities within their organizations. Next slide, please. So to get you started, um, oh, sorry, 
So how do we take this knowledge and all of these goals to our customers and understand where to begin? So to get you started, how do we learn about the processes to implement smart buildings and develop the best practices? How do we get to the standard definitions and the ability to rank the intelligence of our buildings? And I'm happy to report that all of this is just in process. It's something that we're all kind of on the leading edge of and, and have the opportunity to inform and advise. Um, the greatest advice I have are in the bullets listed on this slide. So the actions of smart buildings don't call us to keep our knowledge to ourselves, but to interact and share and to be with each other. Um, we're not going to necessarily as practitioners be able to go out and get patents for what we're trying to do in buildings as we integrate multiple things together. And so it's a topic that we have to get out and just be integrated with each other with. Um, so I encourage you to look at this presentation as a starting point and then continue to investigate and share information. You could look at this as your call to action of where to begin, but look to others, listen to others and share the information that you have. Next slide. To get you started with this and to kind of lean on what was in the previous slide, there's a short list of references here from non-vendor resources. And I'll let you in on a little secret though. And again, I'll take this from my digitally native children. Um, being virtually connected with kids, Google it. Join online groups. Join local chapters of smart building groups. They do exist. Um, also talk with your consultants, colleagues, your vendors. Be smart integrate yourselves into what you're doing. So with all of this great intro being said, I'm going to hand the virtual microphone over to San. He's going to dig deeper into our definition of smart buildings and the why, who, and business case. San? Very good. Uh, thank you, Julianne. That's very good advice um, overall to take in, in the quest for uh, learning about smart buildings. So I'll offer a uh, slightly different perspective on how we can define a smart building from a design point of view, from our client's uh, perspective point of view. So when we uh, start a, a project, a smart building project, uh, we start with why. You know, why should we make this building smart? What problems are we solving? And uh, without getting into that level of detail upfront, it is difficult to come up with a success criteria that we can measure at the end to say whether the uh, program has been successful or not. Um, Julian mentioned different uh, fields, uh, different types of clients, such as the K through 12 market, higher education, corporate real estate, healthcare, uh, sports and entertainment. And uh, you know, most of the different types of clients have unique problems, unique challenges that we are trying to solve for them. But uh, there are certain issues, certain problems that cut across different uh, uh, client types. For example, too much data, not enough information. Um, with the advent of Internet of Things and addition of sensors, we are getting more and more data into our facility. Not only that, we are getting siloed data. You know, you have your building automation system, you have your lighting system, electrical systems. On the building side, you have computerized maintenance management, room reservation systems, occupancy analytics systems. Uh, on the business side, on the digital workplace side. So uh, how do you combine all this data? How do you make sense of all this data uh, that is disparate and in different containers of sorts? And, um, and what business outcomes can be accomplished by combining that data set? Uh, staff retirement is another uh, important trend in our industry, one that has been ongoing for the past several years. Uh, with uh, staff retirement, we lose a lot of institutional knowledge. And frankly, we are not seeing that the type of experience, talent come into our industry that we are losing. It's, it's an area of major concern. Uh, you know, there are always the staff members that uh, understand exactly what the issues are with respect to uh, a piece of equipment like an air handler, why does it keep tripping? Um, they are the ones that know where those rogue three-way valves are located so that uh, if there is a problem, um, these uh, staff members can help us resolve it in a few minutes or a few hours rather than days and weeks and months uh, that could go lingering on 
those issues could go lingering on. So how, how do we address that issue of staff retirement and how does that relate to smart buildings is another topic we'll cover today. Doing more with less, uh, Julian mentioned that uh, earlier, it's a universal uh, requirement in most of the industries and so, so in our industry as well. And uh, smart buildings definitely has a way of automating things in her definition, Julian mentioned the word automation of work processes and uh, that helps us do more with less. And then sustainability goals, a key driver uh, in our industry. And uh, lately it's that, that sustainability, those sustainability goals are getting higher and higher. Uh, we used to call the low hanging fruit, uh, not anymore, that fruit is getting higher and higher. So how, how do we achieve that? The way our industry has responded uh, to that is by designing more complex systems heat recovery chillers, run, al run around um, uh, heat uh, recovery loops, uh, chill beams, variable refrigerant systems. Um, in them, they may not be complex, but the way we are using them to extract the last bit of energy to make it as efficient as possible uh, is, is making uh, definitely making things complex from an operational perspective. So how can smart buildings simplify uh, that user interface and successfully transition uh, high performance design into high performance operation uh, are some of the challenges that we uh, look to solve from a smart buildings perspective by defining uh, those goals very early on. Uh, next slide. Uh, another perspective we take while defining smart building uh, is who is the audience for it. And we can typically uh, look at it from a facility management perspective and look at it from an energy and operational perspective. But if we do that, we are leaving a big component out and, and that's where the occupant comes in. Allowing the, the building uh, to, be, to learn from the occupant's behavior uh, to increase their productivity is another vital goal a smart building can play. And the return on investment with that is significantly higher uh, than with energy and operational strategies. Um, not, not that energy and operational strategies are not important. Uh, by looking at who we are just casting a net wider and uh, making the return on investment approach to smart buildings that much more effective. Uh, next slide. So uh, talking about the traditional roles from a facility management perspective, uh, clearly, uh, energy management is easy to associate with a smart building. But when you have data from disparate systems available, uh, for example, the weather data, occupancy data, uh, room reservation data, and you use complex uh, machine learning algorithms, it now becomes uh, possible to predict energy usage, to predict when the peaks are happening, and thereby allow our energy management team the tools to predict those uh, peaks and have strategies in place both manually as well as automatically uh, to lower those peaks and reduce our energy demand charges. At the same time, with fault detection diagnostics, troubleshooting becomes that much more easier. And if uh, assets, um, equipment operate at um, optimum conditions, they end up saving energy as a byproduct, if not the main outcome. Next next uh, slide. Uh, and, and from an overall project, uh, uh, overall facility manager's perspective, uh, facility managers, uh, you know, uh, you, you can look at it in terms of a small portfolio, a large portfolio, but they have such a vital per, a function to perform. Uh, when we work with clients, some of them manage portfolios that are global in nature and uh, understanding their true cost of operations and what is driving that is, is hidden in, uh, in, in data that they're not able to visualize. So bringing those out as key performance indicators is instrumental in affecting and optimizing the cost of operation of a facility. We talked about complex buildings, but uh, uh, a smart building that can learn uh, from its systems and learn from its historical data can make uh, maintenance easy, can make training easy, and that helps our facility managers operate their facilities that much more effectively. Next slide. 
So uh, to to summarize, when we define a business case or a define a smart building, we define it through a business case. And there are two ways uh, we are doing it. Uh, one is the traditional way, and uh, there are three uh, important points that we consider. We've talked about all three of them. Uh, energy savings, operational efficiency, uh, doing more with less, and that user experience, the occupant that is related to occupant productivity. And those are traditional uh, goals that we have been designing um, smart buildings, defining them with that for the past several years. Uh, next slide. Um, but as time has evolved, uh, we have seen a more uh, outcomes, uh, more uh, definitions, um, more strategies that define the business case for smart buildings. And they include, amongst other things, retaining top talent, um, COVID-19 type strategies. The infrastructure that we use for smart buildings uh, can uh, be uh, well utilized for COVID-19 strategies, such as uh, looking at social distancing and are we um, are we okay with uh, maintaining those social distancing or so are, are we finding um, uh, issues where uh, people are crossing paths and not maintaining that distance that is required or uh, pushing a button to operate the building in purge mode the in the start of the day at the end of the day um, or, or for that matter allowing the occupants to understand when occupancy at a particular floor has exceeded the limits that um, uh, COVID-19 is placing on that particular floor. There are so many of these business cases that we can uh, tackle uh, through uh, the definition of smart buildings. And then data-driven design and data-driven operations. Uh, there's so much opportunity where, you know, some of the assumptions that we make while designing uh, don't have to be assumptions anymore. They can be driven from data of historical, uh, obtained through historical tracking of how buildings of different types have uh, performed. So that makes our design that much more right-sized uh, to, uh, to go forward. And that has implications from operations point of view, energy point of view, and capital first cost investment point of view. Um, so with that, uh, next slide. Um, transition back to Julianne to talk about the building blocks of a smart building. So it took us a little while to get through a definition and, and I think that's indicative of how complex and how, how you know, truly integrated you know, this topic is. Um, so we're gonna build upon that by talking about what are the foundations of the building blocks um, that are kind of core in smart building design. Next slide, please. So the slide showcases four building blocks. Um, there could be more, there could be less, depending on how you wanna categorize or pull those together. Um, but these are really the most notable, um, especially as San and I were talking and pulling together this presentation and they really resonated um, with us. So these four blocks of open protocol, data standards, data storage, and then culture. Uh, next slide, please. So open protocols, um, like the slide says, are needed to have functional infrastructure. And they need to provide this ability of open sharing. They have to connect, they have to share, they have to integrate. Um, and so for those, for those people who are on this who may know me, I love using stories to illustrate and define what something means. Um, and so for you today, today, if you're not familiar, or even if you are, um, I have the story of Babel. And I find the story of Babel to be a good one for open protocols, um, especially, again, you know, as this mechanical engineer who came from a family of carpenters and works for a builder, it, it really just resonates. Um, in the story of Babel, it, it's this. So the Babylonians wanted to build this huge tower that would reach to the heavens. And due to some circumstances, um, the workers all spoke different languages. And so in today's terms, right, they all worked on buildings. However, they couldn't understand each other and they couldn't communicate, they couldn't work together. Um, and so in the end, the Tower of Babel was never built. It was unsuccessful, it was a, it was a failure. Uh, technologies today, like those workers, all speak different languages. And that's okay, um, but think about this. If the workers of the story of Babel could understand each other, even though they spoke the same language, they could have seen some successes. So open protocols don't change the language, but change the way that de the devices communicate so that they connect with each other. Next slide. 
So another building block is the standardization of data and how it's tagged. Um, so as we talked about in the previous slide, open protocols allow things to communicate. But what the data comes via those open protocols from the devices, it needs to be understood. It needs to mean something. So data standards are documented agreements on representation, on format, on structuring, on definition, on tagging, use, manipulation, and their overall management of the data. So we might be able to communicate, but it needs to be efficient and truly understandable. So I have this really smart friend who had the family do a word of the day every day, and his vocabulary was absolutely amazing, but sometimes it's beyond me. So even though speaking the same language, um, I, I didn't get the value out of his conversations. So not using the standards um, can result in challenges. It can add things like cost, challenges with maintenance, and horribly, right, it can result in systems and technology and smarts that don't actually get used. We may build it, we may put it all in, we may have the greatest of intentions, but if people can't get to it, no one will use it. So like the graphic shows, um, if you have too many storage formats, if you have various communication protocols, data that's limited definition or non-standard naming conventions, the results mean that the data collected is error prone, time consuming, costly, inefficient, and, and likely not well utilized. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we know what buildings, smart buildings are. We know who needs them and why and how to define and tag data. But guess what, guys? We got to store it somewhere in order for it to be used. And it was maybe a year ago, I was at um, a SIFI meeting, and SIFI is the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering at Stanford. And one of their data analy analysts was up talking about data and data storage. And he said something that really completely resonated with me. He was talking about that when we have data and we combine it with other data and we analyze it, we've created more data. And thus, that swirling vortex that you see on the page is that just because we've done something and then we have to do something more with it we may end up with even more than we maybe originally thought that we were going to have um, so data collected from smart buildings results in huge considerations that need to be made on not just how you collect it and how you use it but how you're going to store it and additionally for how long so always go back to what you're doing um, and how it connects with the project goals. Know what you're going to do with the data. Don't just collect it because you might use it. Remember data is powerful, but somehow that power, too much power can be too much of a good thing, right? And lastly, decide where and how and for how long you're gonna store it. And, and we all know the cost of storage is, is coming down, but nobody needs to be a data hoarder. Just because it's cheap and you can have it doesn't mean that you need to actually have it. So next slide, please. The last building block that we've identified is culture. And this one is not as tangible or organized or structured as the other pieces that we've been talking about. It's less technical. And it calls on us to tap into that human side of who we are and really gain that you know, integrated understanding of who our clients are. All of what we're doing and all of what we're talking about today is really to make human life better, to make it healthier, to make it safer, to make people's jobs easier, more fulfilling and to really have a purpose. So smart buildings have to make things better and how that success is defined or celebrated really depends on the people and the businesses that we're designing for. It's their culture. It's not always about the opportunities and the technologies. It's about how we combine the intersection of the humans that are gonna be in there and the technologies that are available to them. So if you remember on my earlier slide in the beginning of the presentation, um, that, you know, we talk about how the building type or even location plays a role. What adds into this is the culture of the co corporation. Do they have sustain high sustainability goals? Do they have other goals in tracking of metrics and data, right? So how the customers use the technology and the de data defines that success. This kind of concloses out the functional explanation of the building blocks and smart buildings. Um, San is now going to, to thrill us all with some more technical dives into um, the smart building platform selection. San? Very good. Thank you again, Julian. Very good examples. And uh, you know, when we start collecting all that data, uh, the next question is how, how are you going to utilize that data uh, to drive uh, 
a business case to drive your return on investment. And there are a plethora of choices in our industry. Traditional um, uh, solutions, some uh, new options that have come up. So let's kind of dive into what those uh, options are and how do we select? What are the uh, parameters in selecting that smart building platform? Next slide. So let's, let's start with the, the, the big picture first. Uh, typically when uh, we have that discussion with our clients, uh, there are essentially two drivers for uh, the most important drivers for selecting that smart building platform. Uh, the first one is, should that platform be proprietary or open? And second is cost. Um, the proprietary and open um, discussion is not as straightforward as it might seem. Um, open might be uh, you know, default that why wouldn't we want open? Uh, so the, the definition of open is also subject to uh, interpretation and discussion. We can have many, many discussions on what it means to be open. Uh, everybody has a different perspective on it. But in many cases, we have gone with proprietary solutions. And the reason we have gone is in, in those cases, the functionality that the platform offered far outweighed uh, the fact that it was proprietary. But in, in that case, uh, what we helped our clients with was negotiating an open book pricing approach so that even though they went with a proprietary platform, there was a mechanism in place, a cost model in place uh, to help them uh, go forward without getting uh, price uh, issues uh, as such. Uh, next slide. Uh, then uh, again, once we kind of uh, understand, uh, you know, what type of platform choices we want to make, and the other next criteria is in terms of the software that the platform is able to provide as the functional aspects of it. And, and graphics and alarms and reports and trends are, are those important um, uh, factors that we can, um, we can we value. And to give you an example, uh, graphics are uh, very important in terms of what the user experience that the end user will uh, experience. And uh, nowadays, mobile graphics are extremely important because we are moving away from utilizing traditional thin clients, such as laptops and more in, in the uh, smartphones and tablets that uh, allow uh, our users more access uh, at the right locations with this graphics. So, how uh, the platform delivers those is, is critical. Alarms is a big, big component. Uh, in many cases, we have seen our clients end up with hundreds and thousands of nuisance alarms. And there are many platforms that have some uh, very um, interesting strategies to, to reduce those nuisance alarms and to again, affect that user experience by going to the root cause of alarms that becomes an important criteria in selecting these platforms. And then the ability to store data historically and, and report it, analyze it, trend it, is, is another factor which we'll get into more details uh, in, in the next slides. So our data as such is an important, uh, uh, important factor while selecting this platform. Be it in terms of how do you model this data, and uh, Julian mentioned it in the building blocks. Uh, you know whether you are supporting Project Haystack from for modeling or Brick for modeling. And there are other uh, ways that data modeling comes into uh, play. It's extremely critical in terms of how good that data will be from uh, analysis point of view. At the same time, that historian is very important as more and more data is getting collected and generated, a uh, very good example Julian offered uh, in terms of and analyzing the data generates more data. And then you need a robust historian to collect it, to uh, use it in a more effective manner going forward. Some uh, databases take a large amount of space for the same set of data, while some take a fraction of that. So all important factors while selecting uh, a platform uh, for smart buildings. Uh, next one. Um, where is the data coming from? It's coming from traditional building systems. And for that matter, you need the BACnet and Modbus type drivers that we've traditionally used. But data could be coming from a specialty systems. In healthcare, uh, it could be the MRI machines. It could be something else. Um, for um, uh, corporate real estate, it could be room reservation systems. 
And now we need to look beyond the building systems for where data is coming from. So we need to look at drivers that are beyond basic building systems. In this case, you know, we are looking at more and more API-based drivers for integration, uh, be it now with the business systems or be it for traditional building systems. API-based integration is becoming that much more relevant. Uh, just last week, we had a very deep dive discussions on which uh, integrator platform, uh, driver to select, BACnet or API, between building systems because both were available, both has pros, both had pros and cons. So it becomes that much more important to understand what best for our client, for our project while selecting that plan. Next slide. Uh, and, and then at the end of the day, all what we're doing is for use cases, for solving problems. So uh, be it fault detection diagnostics, uh, be it machine learning. Machine learning is giving us the ability to do predictions, which is very important be it in terms of looking at equipment failure or predicting that uh, energy peak that we talked about from demand control point of view, looking at single pane of glass of for multiple system data. There's so many advantages associated with that in terms of automation of work, in terms of improving the productivity of our uh, facility management staff, and then the, the digital commissioning aspects where we can really understand the data quality um, is it trending correctly? Are we getting the right data values? Are we getting the right units associated with it? All very important use cases while selecting the platform and speak directly to the functionality that platform can offer. Um, next slide. Uh, and then the digital documentation part. For large, uh, large buildings, uh, you, know, you can get inundated with uh, documentation. And uh, you know, even though PDFs uh, are, are used, we run into 1,000 page PDFs, 2,000 page PDFs. I, I was just reviewing a 2,000 page control submittal on a project. That just seemed uh, too, too much data to make any sense of it. But by adding tags, similar to the ones that we add to uh, data points, we should add tags to uh, these uh, uh, pages of documents and digitize that data. Uh, that can become actionable, that, that can become uh, data that can be analyzed. So whether the data is coming from a test and balance, test status balance or commissioning reports, as long as it's tagged, uh, we, can, we can make use of that data. Uh, another important aspect in, in selecting platforms, some, some platforms make it very easy to do that while some others don't. Uh, next slide. Uh, with, with that, uh, we'll, we'll start with case studies, look at how all the best practices that we have talked about translate into case studies and uh, Julianne will start with a very exciting case study. Uh, you're on mute, Julianne. One. Thanks, Sam. It's so great to be able to, to look back at what we've already presented and now be able to look forward at the work that we've completed and to give these examples of projects that we've worked on. Um, next slide, please. So before I dive into a lot of information on this case study, I want to draw your eye to the lower right hand corner of the slide and to the quote and I'll read it. Design and construction is not the hard part. This is from an owner. Design and construction is not the hard part. Getting projects through risk, finance, legal and IT is the hard part. Um, this is not this client that I'm going to present on. It was a different client, but it resonates with me that what we think our owner's struggles are, are not the same ones that we have. And when we keep those in mind, those projects can be more successful. Um, so my case study, as indicated on the slide, is in the sports and entertainment market. In sports and entertainment, in entertainment, there are three main drivers that drive the return on investment, and that's the whole point of these of these venues, right? We're going to do something that's going to be great. We're going to create these experiences, um, but there has to be a return. Um, so of these drivers, one is the athlete experience and their performance, meaning how well or how poorly they can perform. Another is a fan experience, data access and the ability to use our phones, wayfinding, ticketing, you know, that fan experience just making that game day experience even better. And then there's the back of house stuff. It's the amazing stuff that you can't see. And it's a lot of the stuff that San and I have been talking about today. 
So, and as an engineer, right, it's my favorite stuff, looking at building controls, security, lighting, um, things that allow the building to operate more efficiently. Uh, and the ultimate goal though, really, is to have more fun, be more secure, and be more profitable. So on to the next slide and the, and the actual case study. So this is Pfizer Forum. It's the home of the Milwaukee Bucks. They're an NBA pro basketball team, for those of you unfamiliar. Um, it's also home to the Marquette Golden Eagles. Uh, the, uh, it was designed as a multi-purpose arena. It's located in downtown Milwaukee and it opened on August 26, 2018. So just about two years old. It is 714,000 square feet. Uh, the basketball capacity is just over 17,000 and concert seating capacity is about 18,000. The cost of this building was about $524,000 to construct and it hosts up to 200 events in a non-pandemic year. It includes basketball, concerts, hockey, all kinds of great things. Another piece of information about the building uh, that I think is important is it's LEED Silver. So it's beautiful, it houses lots of great smart technologies and I like to say it's beautiful and smart. The intelligent infrastructure supports HVAC, building automation, security, lighting, fire protection, and IT. Integrating these normally standalone systems optimizes the building performance and really delivers that superior fan experience, making fans want to return. I need us to pause, Amara. Sorry. So per the earlier definition um, and building block section of this presentation, we really need to understand the client goals and what their drivers are. What is our benchmark for success? And for this client, these are to enhance the fan experience. The more fun you're having, the more likely you are to spend more money and the more likely you are to return. Uh, to improve the building performance, whether that's environmental, comfort, longevity, it's a, it's a big term but we really wanna make sure that the building performs well in all of these aspects. Reduce the energy use. It's good for the environment. It's good for the wallet. It's a really great story and it's really where we all need to be heading. Um, and reduce the overall environmental footprint, going beyond energy to be looking at waste, water, energy, of course, and then carbon as well. And finally, to provide the best home court advantage. Plans, <laughs> fans and players can be superstitious and we don't want a building that's unlucky and doesn't provide that great home court experience. So meeting these goals translates beyond the walls of the building and for all the people um, who get to the games and go in person, there's so many more watching from home. How do they experience this technology remotely? And one of the examples that I wanna point out is, is that there was a couple years ago and the lights went out in the Super Bowl. I'm not sure who all remembers that. I was not at the game, but I was watching at home. And it's something that I would guess was no fun for the owners. It was no fun for the players, the facility staff, the networks, and the people at home. It's something that we don't necessarily want to be that, that benchmarking point of that, of that um, event. So I point this out because failure can have impacts beyond the walls of the building. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about game day and what the important building technologies uh, were implemented for game day. Security, huge component. Video streaming, digital ticketing, sound, visual innovations. Pfizer Forum has the scoreboard, the ribbing board, over 850 high definition IPTVs throughout all of this, delivering the superior game day experience. Next slide. So on game day, it has to be seamless. It has to be so integrated it's so amazingly cool that you just get to enjoy it and it's the best experience ever. And a large important component of that is broadcast, both internal to the stadium and then also external as my other example um, highlighted. It has to be seamless. It has to allow for the delivery of advertising, communication, live streaming throughout the venue. And at Pfizer Forum, this gives operators the ability to optimize things such as colors, content, branding information, just extending that fun and the integration of the event, but also keeping it safe and secure. Operations. Again, this back of house stuff that I love so much. Uh, my inner nerd loves all the stuff that people don't notice. And so with security, it's the coordination of elevators, tracking of certain individuals, providing directions and info in case of an emergency, noticing things that just are kind of out there happening. 
In the HVAC realm, it's comfort and indoor air quality, looking at good ventilation. And today's day and age, with the pandemic going on, it's making sure that people feel safe and comfortable coming back and returning to the venues and returning to the game. So other operations considerations include power consumption and environmental impact tracking. Um, one of the big things about loving about this project is that it's tangible and all of the stuff that San and I have talked about today can somehow be weaved into the integration of this. But the, the cool thing is, is for this project, you can actually experience it uh, virtually. You can go back and check out games that were presented here. You can go look at, at different things that had happened. And so it's a great out front um, project to be able to, to have anybody potentially experience, not just kind of hidden away in, in an office or, or something somewhere. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to San who has two different building types. And one of the things I like about our case studies is that we really are highlighting how three different projects can have three different sets of expectations and goals. So Sam, back to you. Uh, very good, thank you. So uh, if you skip one more, uh, Amara. So uh, we'll talk about it more from a healthcare point of view and one corporate real estate point of view. And, and there's another difference between these two case studies. Uh, the healthcare client case study is 14 years old uh, and uh, the corporate real estate um, case study is very, very new. We are implementing uh, this project as we speak. Uh, the reason we wanted to share both these case studies was to kind of give a perspective on how things have evolved and what some of the outcomes have been. So uh, in this particular instance, uh, we started working with the client uh, in, in the early 2000s. And the goal was to add a new cancer hospital, half a million square feet, uh, without adding more staff. Uh, so the challenge was, how do you do more with less? And uh, we, um, at that point, were collecting just about uh, 30,000 points for a two and a half million square feet campus. And the cancer hospital alone added that much more. So we started collecting more and more data and we started using more and more data. And with that came uh, the uh, approaches of uh, fall detection diagnostics, uh, data naming, so that we could do more with less. And then uh, as uh, in the last decade, in 2010, we added another 500,000 square feet new hospital, which was the um, uh, cardiovascular neuroscience tower. And that, that again doubled the amount of points that we were adding with that building. Just a lot more data was becoming available and, and we were starting to use that. Uh, the big difference was that the data from the first hospital, cancer hospital, drove the design of the cardiovascular tower. And uh, we, on the next slide, we'll talk about some of the outcomes uh, that uh, we had, but the intent of the client was that uh, they, they wanted to add uh, more square footage without adding more uh, staff. The uh, patient uh, comfort was paramount for them and is paramount for them. And they, they wanted a system that was uh, predictive, that was telling the technicians what to do. They didn't want the technicians to take shortcuts in order to solve uh, their uh, uh, short-term challenges because in their experience, they were creating long-term nightmares. Uh, next slide. So uh, the way we accomplished this was through these strategies. We integrated building and business systems, uh, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, medical gases, with uh, computerized maintenance management, um, that is, uh, and some of the other business systems uh, for, the, for the healthcare client. And then uh, through integration and through uh, data, we automated their work processes. So uh, a task that took 15, 20 steps uh, involved multiple people could now be done with a few steps and less number of people. Alarms was one example. By going to root cause of alarms immediately, it allowed us to uh, reduce the time the operator spent in uh, looking at nuisance alarms, for example. We had a robust data historian. Uh, again, this project was done 14 years back. We didn't have the type of fall detection diagnostic software today that are available on market back then. So we used Microsoft SQL reporting services to do that work and it works really well to, to this day. 
uh, those uh, data analytics tools that we got uh, from off the shelf IT uh, solutions uh, are still working uh, till this day in, in a very uh, uh, good manner. Uh, next slide. Uh, we used construction specifications institution institutes division 25 spec format and incorporated smart building requirement in the other uh, specifications for other disciplines including uh, mechanical plumbing and electric next slide um, another uh, strategy that we used was a, a, a plug fest to test the connectivity the integration before it was implemented in real time and we did point to point testing to verify that uh, all the integration worked correctly. Uh, next slide. Uh, again, uh, culture was a big uh, aspect, and Julian mentioned it as part of our building blocks. Uh, uh, training people, developing new job functions, uh, writing what the new level of expectations were, in incorporating the role of information technology and culturally addressing it from a people point of view was one of the key aspects of this project, though non-technical, it was very, very important in, in driving the project to success. Next slide. So what are the outcomes? Uh, so uh, this project has uh, uh, a track record of about 10, 12 years now, and we did bring that building online uh, with, without adding more staff. We reduced uh, alarms of that existing campus as well as new campus by 90% and energy reduction uh, $5 million, 30% uh, was recorded by the client. We've published a couple of papers on it. Uh, the project has won uh, ASHI Association, uh, um, American Society of Healthcare Engineers uh, uh, Energy to Care Award. Uh, patient satisfaction scores uh, have been maintained at 96% for the last several, several years. And now that data is driving design and operations. They are using uh, that strategy to avoid capital costs uh, uh, from, uh, from an investment point of view. So overall, some very good outcomes that have been sustained for the last 10 plus years. Next slide. So uh, from um, a project that we did several years back uh, to one that we are uh, working on uh, today, uh, it involves a corporate real estate client. And in this particular instance, uh, the client uh, was moving from a million and a half square feet space to a million square feet space. So they were reducing roughly by 30%, but uh, they wanted to use, I mean, the staff was the same. They just wanted to use the space that much more effectively. So that was the prime driver behind you uh, using a uh, smart uh, buildings. Uh, they, they wanted to use smart buildings to enhance that uh, user experience to improve their productivity. At the same time, this is a bank, so cybersecurity is critical. Cybersecurity is critical in any type of uh, uh, with any type of clients, but in this particular case, um, uh, being a bank, that was much more important. Next slide. So some of the strategies that we've incorporated in this project are occupant analytics. We want to understand how space is getting used and how effectively it's getting used. Room booking plays an important part into that, uh, as, as well as indoor positioning. To enhance that experience, uh, the, the people, uh, the, the staff is able to know where they are in, in the building. And with that, a host of strategies, host of experiences are open to them, including booking a room that they are close to, looking at points of interest, and uh, uh, if they see something wrong, they can take a picture and submit a work order uh, with a location aware uh, services so that uh, the experience uh, makes it very seamless for them. Uh, next slide. And then behind the scenes, uh, all you know, we are looking at so many different building systems in, in IoT systems. All of them are converging on, on the same backbone. Uh, and uh, we, we are looking at cybersecurity applications with it, and then a building app to enhance that experience uh, is also included in this, uh, in this uh, project. Next slide. Uh, so to summarize, uh, you know, uh, defining a smart building at the very beginning is very important. Taking a building's block approach is crucial for future proofing for our client. And then 
leveraging the right platform that addresses uh, the use cases for our client is equally important. Is that uh, Amara? All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for those examples and for all of that information. However, that is all that we have time for today. I would like to thank Julianne Lau and Sanjio Pasari for this outstanding information. Again, additional resources and the quiz to earn continuing education credit is available in the session course agenda under resources. Finally, on behalf of CFE Media and Technology, thank you for attending. This concludes this portion of the training. Thank you and goodbye.